Good job. Good job. Because evidently that does not shut off like I thought it did. If you got a Bible with you, you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew in chapter number 16. Matthew in chapter number 16. And I will get to that passage of Scripture here after a little bit. But I am going to preach a message today uh, that I have preached before. Oh, and I need to dismiss Junior Church, so we'll do that. Uh, Brother Mark will stand up, and Brother Mark will make his way to the back. And as he gets towards the back, Brother Mark's not as fast as he used to be. But we'll let him get to the back. Young people, you can stand up. You can be dismissed out the back with Brother Mark. Very good. Very good. Tony, you want to push that door shut? Hit that with a hand really fast. Very good. That keeps the sun off my face and helps me to focus a little better. But um, I'm going to preach a message tonight or this morning uh, that I have preached a, a handful of times. I've preached this message in Virginia. I've preached this message in Missouri. I have preached this message down in, uh, I believe, Canton, South Dakota. And I have preached this message here at our church before. Uh, it's one of my favorite messages to preach. Uh, Brother Rocco de Peace, when I was in college, he was one of my uh, Bible teachers. And it was Sunday school. He was also my Sunday school teacher. And when I went to Sunday school one morning, and uh, he had shared a, a thought about what God counts for something. And, uh, and I wrote a message kind of based on that thought. And it's been my favorite message to preach now for a handful of years. I really enjoy it. And after I watched TJ do something, uh, I developed this message kind of with that same thought out of some uh, Bible notes that I had in my Bible for way back in the day when I was probably 19 or 20 years old listening to Brother Rocco de Peace. And so I'll share that message with, with you this morning to kind of challenge us. And this is a message that I, I probably preach uh, maybe once every uh, two or three years just because I enjoy it. And so if you've got your spot there in Matthew 16, just hold it, because I'm going to tell us a story and then elaborate on that a little bit, talking about the judgment of our master. And one day we're going to stand before the master of this universe, and he is going to be the judge of what takes place in this life. He's going to be the judge of this earth. He's going to be the judge of every word that I say. The Bible says every idle word that comes out of my mouth. God will be the judge of those things. God's going to be the judge of everything done in my body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. God is going to look at my life and he is going to divide things out. And I have preached now this spring and mentioned these passages several times, even this spring, the idea of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. And when we go to the judgment seat of Christ, everything in our body, every Every decision we make, every place that we go, every word that we say is going to be divided up into those six categories. It's going to have value or it's not. It's going to go through the fire and God's going to say, that counts for something. Or it's going to go through the fire and God says, that amounts to nothing. It just burns up. It's a waste. But we will one day, all of us, stand before the Master. And the Master will have the one vote whether or not something counts. And we can live in a society and, and everybody in our life can say, this is what matters. But in the end, there's only one vote that is given to whether or not something counts. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. We, uh, If you've ever played dodgeball, if you can remember back in high school, or if you remember uh, playing baseball or anything like that, you, you hit a ball and it, it seems like it, it almost goes over third base. Maybe it doesn't. And uh, all the, the kids on the inside, they'll say, that counts. And all the kids on the outside say, that doesn't count. You know, you got teams and they divide that out. I've done enough dodgeball in the back with, with kids that all of a sudden it hits them and it hits them right in the head. And all of a sudden, that doesn't count. And everybody on their team says, 
That doesn't count. You hit them in the head. Everybody on the other team says, a hit to hit. That counts until it, until it reverses. Uh, but there's always this dispute about what counts, what doesn't. And if you are the only adult in the room, and you're the one that said go, and you're the one that determines the winner, you're also the one that says, that counts, you're out. That doesn't count, you're still in. And you get to make that judgment. You get to be the one who determines that. Now, I can think back to a day in, uh, I'd say this is back 2000, and I would guess 2009. This might have been 2010. Uh, I went to Brookings because TJ had an event, and we were going to go watch TJ uh, earn his black belt in Taekwondo. Now, I, I have seen Taekwondo sometimes, and it's almost like a, a fitness routine. You're just like this, and it's doing one of these things, and you're just, it's all about exercise, and anybody can do it, and all shapes and sizes, and you know, you just keep going, and a few months later, you're this belt, and a few months later, you're this belt, and you may be just as unhealthy and uncoordinated and no more talented than you were when you started, you just progress. Well, where TJ was at, that's, that's not how it worked. He had a, a, I don't know if you call him a sensei, I don't know any of that stuff, uh, but his name was Master Scott, Master Scott. So he had elevated, I think he was a third degree black belt, and so his official title was a master. So he was Master Scott. And Master Scott sat down, and he had this podium in front of him, and, and he sat down like, like a judge in a courtroom. But that was Master Scott. And when TJ went to earn his black belt, it wasn't like when, when I was in Taekwondo. I am a blue belt, which would go well with this suit, I think, by the way. This blue belt wrapped around nice and tight. Uh, but I am a blue belt. And I was a blue belt in Taekwondo, and it was super easy. Uh, you just went through the motions and you progressed. That's not the case with Master Scott. So we went to go watch uh, TJ do all this stuff to be able to earn his, his black belt. And I remember we got there and he sent TJ out, uniform, everything, uh, belt tied around, all these things. And he sent him outside to go run. And TJ had to go run and run and run. He went and did this big old long run, came back, sweaty, tired. And he comes in and he says to TJ, push-ups. And TJ does push-ups till he can't do push-ups anymore. And when he can't do another push-up, he rolls over and does sit-ups till he can't do a sit-up anymore. And then after he can't do sit-ups, he rolls over and does push-ups till he can't do push-ups and rolls over and sit-ups. And he just fatigued him, just beat him up. And TJ's up there. And you know, if you ever get tired to stand up straight and to do all this, it gets harder and harder. And TJ's winded. I mean, he just beat him up. And it's, it's not just do this many, it's do as many as you can. Do as many as he can, over and over again. So TJ's up there, and Master Scott then has this whole program that he does, because every single belt, whether you're a white belt or a yellow belt, you have something called a, a form, and it is a very specific set of things like this, and, and I can't even, uh, I can't even uh, demonstrate some of them. But I do remember my, my white belt. I remember my yellow belt one. Uh, but as you progress, they get significantly harder. They all have to be done exactly right. If you make a mistake, there's no black belt. If you don't do it the right way, there's no black belt. It's the timing. There's times when you're supposed to yell, times when you're not supposed to yell, times when you do a sidekick or a turning side. I mean, it's all very specific. But when you're very fatigued, and now you're up there doing everything exactly the right way, and TJ does that, does all those things, tired and sweaty and already beat up. And then he goes, and there's these guys, and they're, they're holding all these boards, and TJ has to go and break boards with this kind of kick, break boards with this kind of punch, break this many boards with this kind of a thing. And he's breaking all of these boards. And now we get down to the end. And there's this thing called a speed break. Because sometimes if you were to hold the, both sides of a board and you could just slowly come in and if something was strong enough, it would just break that board. It doesn't even have to be fast. But if you just held one side of a board, you could hit it with a train. And if the train's not moving fast enough, the board's just going to get out of the way. You have to have some speed. And so TJ's been able to do these speed breaks before. And you just have to do a speed break. And then he gets his black belt. And we've watched Master Scott just beat him up and beat him up. And we've watched him do these board breaks and those board breaks. And, and in between everything, more push-ups, more sit-ups. I mean, the guy just beating him up. But TJ's passing everything. And he says, do this speed break. So TJ picks up that board and you hold it yourself 
and you have to punch it hard enough that it doesn't just fly out of your hand. You have to break it. So TJ's done this before he picks up this board. He, he hits it and he yells because when TJ does Taekwondo, I don't know what it is, but he's like the loudest yeller. Some guys get up and they go, yeah, and TJ gets up and goes, yeah. <laughs> if you can imagine it. But TJ just belts this out. Um, and so TJ does this, and it's like a Jackie Chan movie all of a sudden. He screams, and he hits the thing, and this board just blows up. And uh, people go out there, and as soon as anything breaks, people just show up, and they, they go out there, they gather everything up, they clean everything up, and they get out of the way. It's all very well-structured things. So TJ does that. He's standing there like this, breathing heavy, sweaty, and he's, he's done all this now. And Master Scott is impressed with, with what TJ has done. Master Scott has heard that TJ can do two boards at a time with a speed break, which is something that almost nobody can do. And so Master Scott says, do three. Tells him to do three boards, which nobody in there has ever seen done, which TJ has never done, which Master Scott has not seen somebody do. But he says to TJ, do three. So now you gotta hold up three boards, hit them three boards as fast as you can and as hard as you can, and if those three boards break, TJ gets to leave with a black belt. If those three boards don't break, TJ doesn't leave with a black belt. And nobody's ever seen it done before. He's already tired. He's already met all of the other requirements. He's already done everything like he's supposed to. And Master Scott says, do three. And uh, he says, you've done three before. And TJ goes, I've never done three. He's like, okay, we'll do three. And Master Scott's sitting up there, and he's, he's the... He's the boss. Everybody in there just looks at him for all the decisions to be made. TJ picks that up, and everybody's just sitting there. I mean, there's this whole crowd, and uh, we're all sitting in these chairs. There's all these people around in this whole gym, and TJ's the center of attention right there in the middle. He picks up these three boards, and the whole place is silent, and there's no noise. Everybody's just fixated from the oldest to the youngest. Everybody wants to see this because it's big deal stuff. And we've already seen him do all this stuff, and it was quite impressive. And he takes those three boards, and in classic TJ style, he comes back and he hits that, and he just screams. And when he does, these boards just blow up. And there's pieces everywhere. There's, there's all these pieces, this big explosion, big loud crack, and the crack goes louder than the scream. It was really something. And everybody in there just goes nuts. They think, this is the greatest thing. We just watched him do this thing. And everybody's clapping, and everybody's happy. And all these boards start coming to the ground, and then we look. Like, and one of those boards is still a nice, perfect square. It hits the ground, and it starts toppling like this. And I don't know, God must, God must have really intervened, balanced that thing out. It was so dramatic. And this thing just rolls over to the edge of the mat. And everybody screamed when this thing exploded. And now everybody's silent again. And like all the air sucked out of the room, and we see this board roll over, stand up, and then fall down. And everybody just goes silent. And Mr. Scott's there looking at this. Master Scott's there watching this. TJ, you can see you standing there. And, uh, you know, I almost did it. And everybody thought that he did. And so then the whole place is quiet again. Everybody's kind of sad. They're gathering up all these pieces. And the guy goes over to pick up that board. As he picks it up, he gets about right here. And half that board falls off and goes down to the ground. And so he's standing there. And he right away looks up at Master Scott like, I'm holding half a board. And I didn't break this. TJ broke this. He's looking at Master Scott. And everybody who was watching him pick it up saw him pick up that board because it's now the most important thing in that whole room is this board that did not break. He picks it up. Now he's only holding half a board because TJ broke it. And it just barely held together. But TJ already was judged as having not broken that board. He looks over and everybody goes zoom, right to Master Scott. Every one of us just zoom, right over there at Master Scott. Master Scott just standing there is very poised, is very, uh, I don't, don't know the right word for it, but he's just like a stoic position because he's this third degree black belt and this is a very formal thing to him. And he just looks over at that board and he takes maybe four or five seconds, which isn't very long, but it felt like a long time. And he just stares over at that board, and he kind of looks over at TJ, and everybody's staring at him because he's the master. He's Master Scott. Everybody knows that TJ broke that board. Everybody in there has an opinion 
about whether or not that counts or doesn't count. And I believe it was a unanimous, everybody would say, TJ did it. But it doesn't matter because there's only one Master Scott. And there's only one guy who gives his vote. He looks and he sees that. Now he's looking at TJ and he just does one of these. Starts clapping. And everybody starts clapping because he made a judgment. Master Scott said, that counts. And everybody's standing up. Everybody's so excited. And there's TJ, perfectly stoic military guy. You know, he's just emotionless. And so he fails emotionless. He succeeds emotionless just that way. Uh, but Master Scott, he says, that counts. Now think about that. Everybody that was there knew there was only one vote that mattered. Everybody had an opinion, but there was only one that mattered. Everybody's heart went like this when it exploded. Everybody's heart went like that and when it rolled away in one piece. Everybody's heart went like this when it was good, and then we were just elated when he got it. And he came out there, and having, having never seen anybody break three boards with a speed break before, ties that belt around TJ, and boy, he was pretty proud. Sweaty mess. I mean, just disgusting looking, but very proud. But one guy, Master Scott, he was the one who was able to judge that. Every single one of us, every one of us, we will stand before God one day. And God has the only one, the only one vote that matters. And everybody can have their opinion. But God's going to say that thing you spent your life on counts for something. Or it doesn't. Wood, hay, stubble. All these things that you spent your time on, the hours you invested, the things that you had to say, the relationships that you built or didn't build, the things you pursued and possessed, and all the stuff that you chased, God is going to be the only one who ever has the opportunity, regardless of what everybody says, he's going to say, that counts, or he'll say, that doesn't count. I want to talk, first of all, about a few things that do not count. Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse number 24. Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 24. I'm very thankful to have the Word of God. Because what the Word of God does, while I am still alive, while I am an earthling, while I am wearing this flesh, while I am still breathing air with a physical body, and death has not come, I have the Word of God that says, this is what God's going to say about this. This is what God is going to think about this. This is the judgment that God is going to give. So God doesn't make us live life and then, then just hope that one day we'll stand before the master and just hope that it all works out. That's not it. God gives us clear instruction. And one of the things we'll see right off the bat, the very first thing we'll look at is something that God says, it doesn't count for anything. Look at verse number 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And we may not understand that sometimes. Maybe if you've not been in church a long time, the idea of losing your life and, and gaining or the idea of gaining life and losing. What God is saying is if in this life, I'm investing only in this life, then in the next one, I'll be lacking. But if in this life, I am not investing in this one, but investing in that one. I give up the opportunities in this life, give up the niceties in this life, and invest it in that one. Then I will gain life. That's what God is saying. He's saying let's deny ourselves today so that tomorrow there can be great gain. That's what God's saying. Now as we look on, verse number 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, we labor to be able to acquire in this world. We labor for the nicer house. We labor for the nicer car. We labor for a bigger bank account. We labor for nice suits. And boy, that's a nice suit, isn't it? My wife is not in here, but I already made this statement. I said in Sunday school, if anybody wants to, while I'm standing near my wife, come tell me how good my suit looks because she doesn't like it. I would be very appreciative of that. And so I'm standing over here, and Brother Rick comes over and says, man, that's a, forget exactly what he says. Boy, that's sharp-looking suit. And my wife already knew. So one of y'all 
in Sunday school, went and squealed on me, ruined my whole party. Anyway, <laughs> I think maybe my wife's just smart enough. Uh, but I got my eye on Todd over there. I don't know. Somebody told on me. But we look and we see Jesus here makes that statement. You can gain everything. You can pursue everything. And if you could somehow own it all, if you owned the cattle on a thousand hills, if you owned all the real estate, if you owned more land than McDonald's and the Catholic Church together, if you did all of that, God would eventually stand as the master of the universe and he would look at you and he would say, doesn't count for anything. Doesn't count. He says, I, I'm the creator of everything. Everything is already mine. It's all mine. As much as you labor to pursue and to, to accumulate as much of it as you can, you don't take any of it with you. And standing for God, the possessions that we labor for and we, we so give our mind, our energy, we stress over, it affects our spirit and our mind and our health and all of this stuff in our life. So geared towards stuff. And God says, doesn't even count. Doesn't matter. There's no value to it beyond this life. He says, let's deny ourselves in this life. Let's invest in something that does count. And he says, our earthly stuff doesn't count, regardless of how much you were able to get. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter number 5. Acts in chapter number 5, which will be the same verses that I close with today also. But Acts in chapter number 5. And we'll look at verse number 28. Acts 5, verse number 28. The apostles, they're doing the ministry that God had given them to do. God had a, a job for Peter. He began preaching at Pentecost, and uh, he's been seeing people saved. If you were to read chapter number 4, there's all kinds of things with the, the Holy Spirit that is going on, and there's Ananias and Sapphira, and there's, there's all this stuff taking place. And they're busy doing the work that God has for them to do. They've already left everything. We're talking about a group of men who... Uh, were tax collectors, and they forsook that. A group of men who owned their own businesses and, and uh, were fishermen and doctors and things like that. And, and uh, it's believed Luke to have been a, a physician. And if we're anything like today, that's not, a, a low, that's not a, a low income there. He's probably doing significantly good and, or, or well, or however you want to say that. So we look, we have a, a group here of these apostles they come from a, a varied background, but they have all left that income. Because as we saw, one day we'll stand before God and the things that we possess, it doesn't count. And here we have a group of guys, they've left the things that they possess. They've dropped their nets, they've left their fishing, they've left their jobs. Now they are following after Jesus and they're doing the work that God wants them to do. Now we're going to see they're in a situation and the, the leadership among the Jews... They're saying, we don't want you to preach about Jesus. We want you to keep your mouth shut. Don't preach the gospel. Don't talk about the resurrection. Don't talk about Jesus Christ as God. That's blasphemy. And they want to silence them. Look at verse number 28. Verse number 28, they say, saying, did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? Talking about Jesus. And the apostles are sharing Christ everywhere they go, talking about Jesus. And they say, did we not straightly command you they're saying, we, we made it very clear. Were we not clear when we said this? Did we not say it plainly enough? Did you not understand it? They're saying, so we were, we were plain. We straightly told you, don't talk about Jesus. Very simple. And I believe they're standing back, scratching their heads going, we are the authority here. The law here is, is very plain. Your instructions are very clear. We told you not to talk about Jesus. And... Behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. See, they're trying to get out of responsibility. They're trying to uh, come out the other side of this whole Jesus thing without losing any power, without losing any influence. And if you remember the idea of Acts chapter number 2, when Peter was preaching at Pentecost, he said, uh, whom ye have crucified... He pointed right to the Jews and he said, you guys did this. And many of them received, thousands of them actually. They got saved, they got baptized, they were added to the church. All that happened in Acts chapter number 2. 
But this is that group that was not interested in what they had to say. They said, we told you to keep your mouth shut. And you're going all through Jerusalem telling everybody about it. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Look at verse number 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Think about that. This is a group of men. They haven't been slaughtered yet. But this group of men, every single one of them goes to be executed. Every single one of them. Peter crucified upside down. Thomas killed in India. You look and you, you see all of these men one by one. They decide to listen to what God says rather than what men say. And every one of them pay the price. The only one that survives his execution is John. And John is here with Peter. And John was one of them with Peter that said, all of these opinions can be there. All of this opposition can be there. But we're going to listen to what God has to say, regardless of what man has to say. And John, he ends up being boiled in oil, and they, they do these different things. I don't know how anybody survives being boiled in oil, but John did. And I believe that God supernaturally brings him through that. Because we look and we, we have three books of the Bible right at the end. Well, John gave us those. And in the book of Revelation, John gave us that also. There's, there's a whole lot when people say, I read the back of the book and we win. Well, the back of the book is only there because while John survived being boiled in oil, he then went right on, uh, right the, the very end of Scripture. God says, I got a job for you. But we look and we see these guys, when they say, we're going to obey God, not man. It wasn't just a, a boldness in speech. It was lived by the life that they lived also. They practiced what they preached. Their talk talked, their walk talked. But their walk talked louder than their talk talked. And they lived that way. And when I consider now in our life, when we consider one day standing before the master, now he can be way more stoic than Master Scott. Way more authority than Master Scott. Stronger, better, smarter, wiser, more thorough with everything. We're going to stand before the creator of this universe and our master. And he's going to say, this counts, this doesn't. And what we learn from the word of God, my pursuit for stuff, God says, it doesn't matter. My concern for the, the public opinion for those that are around me, God says, that doesn't matter. It doesn't. We look and we consider Joseph. The people around Joseph, they thought, you know what? Joseph would be better off as a slave. God had a different plan for Joseph. God raised him to second in command of the most powerful country in the world. And God used Joseph to bring his family uh, through poverty and through this famine so that they can live and grow and become the great nation of the children of Israel. That was God's plan. But everybody around Joseph said, this guy, this guy, he's a dreamer. Let's throw him into this wild beast. Well, when, what value is it? We might as well sell him. So they do. That was the opinion of Joseph. That wasn't the opinion that God had for Joseph. That was those that were around him. You consider, um, you move forward, the idea of, of Noah. Noah, everybody for sure looked at Noah building a boat in the, middle of, in the middle of dry land, building this great big boat, gathering up the animals. Imagine you'd look at him and think, you are insane. You're insane. Everybody in the world must have thought, Noah, you're nuts. What are you thinking? But God had a plan, and Noah said, you know what? I'm just going to do what God tells me to do, even if the whole world thinks I'm crazy. And he did. And when we look and we see the only opinion that mattered was God's opinion. Not everybody else is around. You think about the idea of Jesus. Jesus, when Jesus was here, people thought he was a blasphemer. People thought that at times they said, must be Beelzebub. They thought he was a devil. They thought he was a demon. They thought he was all kinds of different things. Some people thought he was worthless just because where he was from. Does any good thing ever come from Nazareth? They had all kinds of opinions about him. They even crucified him for it. But God raised him from the dead. It was the opinion of God that mattered. David, they thought he was too small. David, they thought he was just this lad and this youth. And Goliath, a warrior from his youth. The opinion of David, when he went out, Goliath, Goliath was insulted by the fact that they sent out David. His brothers were offended that he was there. Everybody there had an opinion about David. God had a different one. We look and we see when I pursue things in my life, some things that don't matter, God says the stuff I possess doesn't count for anything. 
The idea of looking around and trying to make every single other person happy and worried about the opinions of those that are around me. They don't count. Just like everybody when we watched TJ and the explosion of three boards, we all thought that counts. But it doesn't count until the master says whether or not it counts. Let's go to another passage. Let's go to, uh, I believe we're looking for Genesis in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis in chapter number 15, we're going to see some things that God says does count. Some things that we need to be pursuing. Some things that I believe account for something, and they matter. Genesis chapter number 15. Let's look at verse number 1, and I'll read all the way to verse number 6. Genesis chapter 15, the Bible says in verse number 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell these stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. See, Abraham had some faith there. Abraham looked up to the stars and Abraham can look over at his wife and say, Wow, you're an old lady. I'm an even older man. This doesn't happen anymore. We don't make babies any longer. But God says, look up at the stars. Can you count them? That's the seed of Abraham. And Abraham believed it. Abraham had faith in what God had said. And God looking down at the faith of Abraham, God says, I'm going to count that. That counts for something. And if I look and I see that God looks at the faith of Abraham and says, that counts, I know that one day I'll stand before God and God will say to me, all that stuff you're pursuing, I own it all. You're just a steward of it. None of that counts. What I have to say, that matters. What everybody else has to say, that that's not what counts. That faith that you had, that faith even if it's the size of a mustard seed, that faith, that's that, that foundation of Christ that everything else is built on. God will look at your life and God will say, is there faith there? And God will say, I count that. That counts for something. I think that's neat. Let's go to Phineas, Psalm 106. Go to Psalm 106 and we'll see God address something different. Psalm 106, what's going on is God wanted a pure bloodline because God is going from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. And if you went to the book of Luke, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, through Noah and all that corruption that is there, to Abraham, to bring in a nation of people through Jacob, and then David, and then Solomon, all the way down to Mary and Joseph, and they have this baby. Obviously, Joseph being the, the stepfather there, but Mary and this pure bloodline all the way through. God had a desire for the children of Israel to be separated. And a lot of times people go to the Word of God and they... They go to different places where you, you can't marry interracially or anything like that. And God does not give that to us. Uh, there's no difference in, in who we marry. And uh, it doesn't matter what color somebody is. I believe culture uh, culture and different things, you want to examine those things and use some wisdom and all that. But God does not restrict who we marry. But with the children of Israel, God had a desire specifically for this one family to become a nation that would produce a specific bloodline for Jesus Christ. And he had a desire to keep that pure. That's that, that bloodline that runs through. People call it the scarlet thread through the word of God. And now God has given the children of Israel some instructions. Stay away from the idols. Don't go after other gods. And here's all these, uh, these different people that are trying to turn your heart towards other gods. And God says, stay away from those people. They are corrupting my people. So God wants to put up a wall of separation. And all of a sudden, these Midianitish women come in and they're turning the hearts of the Jews towards other gods. And God says, we cannot do that. 
God says, stop doing that. And they continue. And here's a man, Phineas, who stands up, and this is a graphic story. Uh, and uh, sometimes you read the word of God and there's some rough stuff in there. But we as people, we can be rough people. And Phineas stands up, he grabs this javelin, he goes, he finds this man and this woman, this Jewish guy, and this Midianitish woman, he runs over there, <laughs> he stabs right through the two of them into the ground. It's a rough story. But now here in Psalm 106, God gives a conclusion to that. This has happened in Israel's past. Now David, as a psalmist, is writing down the inspired words of God, and we get to see the heart then of God towards what takes place. Psalm 106. Let me find the couple verses I want to look at. Look at verse number 30. Verse number 30. Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. And that was counted. Listen to that statement there. God looked at the faith of Abraham and says, I count that. That counts. Now he's looking at Phineas. And Phineas stood up for righteousness. Phineas did that which was right when all around him, people were violating the law of God. When all around him, people were doing whatever they want, whatever felt good, whatever was convenient, whatever was easy. That's what everybody was doing. And Phineas stood up and Phineas said, God gave us a command and we're going to obey that command. And God looks at Phineas and God makes this statement. And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. We wouldn't know who Phineas is, except God wanted to put him in the word of God. So we're talking about him today. We talk about what does that mean, generations forever? Well, I'm a generation. My dad's a generation. My grandpa's a generation. You go way back in time, and this happened with Phineas, and God has recorded it. So now, thousands of years, 4,000 years later almost, God says, remember Phineas? Don't ever forget that guy. We look then, and I can learn a few things. The stuff that I possess, God says, that doesn't count. That doesn't count for anything. The idea of trying to uh, consider all the opinions of the people around me, if it's contrary to the word of God, their opinion doesn't matter because this is the opinion that matters. We look and God says, the faith, if I can have faith in my life, God says, that counts for something. If I can stand up for righteousness in a world that turns from anything good, in a world that runs from truth, in a world that elevates ungodliness, in a world that is chasing after all these pleasures contrary to everything that we see here. We have a world, and if you just open up your eyes and you read Galatians chapter number 5, the world is not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The world does not follow after the fruit of the Spirit. It's almost entirely the works of the flesh that we find in Galatians chapter number 5. There's no shortage in this life to stand up for what is right. There's no shortage of it. We have a society that preaches and teaches all kinds of things directly opposing what the Word of God has to say. Every single day, we have opportunity to stand up for righteousness. Imagine, Phineas, he stood up for it. And God says, that counts for something. I believe when you stand before God and you have your faith, God says, that counts. And the master of the universe will say so. I believe that when you stand before the master of this universe, having took a stand and stood for righteousness, God is going to say, that counts for something. We count that one around here. That's not gold, that's not wood, hay, stubble. That's gold, silver, precious stones. That's something of value. And I believe it is something that we lack oftentimes in our churches. We lack it in our homes. We lack it in our, our neighborhoods, our conversations, our workplace. We lack that. We get around and there's eight guys that think something is funny or eight guys that talk a certain way. And we fall in line rather than being distinct rather than being a peculiar people, rather than holding up a level of holiness that causes you to stand out different, we rather fit in. Teenagers do it. Adults do it. Kids do it. You watch my kids when the neighbors come over. There's a tendency to behave different than what they do if they're outside following the rules that we have. It's different. I can watch the attitude of our children alter very subtly and very easily with what's around them. It's our nature to do that. That's why God looks at Phineas and says, that counts, because that's not normal. That's standing up for right. Got another one. Let's go. I'm going to skip one because I recognize I'm already out of time. The idea of keeping our mouths shut, the Bible says that counts for something also. But I'm going to skip and go back to Acts chapter number five. Acts in chapter number five, 
We'll go to verse number 28. I'm going to read through a, a portion of this, and we're going to get down to the end. Acts chapter number 5, verse number 28, and I'm going to read. Let me look here. I'll probably go to the end of the chapter. So we'll read that together. So I'm going to skip that last one just for time. But looking at verse number 28, this is the apostles again. They're standing there, and I'm just going to read that again to put it into context, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, we have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. <laughs> Think about the boldness. They just said, You're preaching about Jesus. We told you, don't say his name. You're going to try and bring that upon us. And Peter, he says, you slew Jesus. He's saying his name. He's throwing that right on them. He's taking as much of the blood of Christ as he can and throwing it on them, saying, this is on you. Exactly what they just told them not to do. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of those things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For better these days rose up uh, Thetis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who were slain. And, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee, and in those days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men. And let them alone, and for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. He's saying, he's saying, this guy came, he preached a message. 400 people said, I'm going to follow this guy. And that guy died, and they scattered. Another guy showed up, and this guy preached a message, and uh, he had a following, and he died. And everybody scattered. He says, now here comes Jesus. Jesus come, he preaches, uh, there's a following, Jesus died, and now they will scatter. So this is his reasoning. He says, let's not upset the people because there's a whole lot of people wanting to follow Jesus. But let's let this thing run its course. He says, but if it be of God, verse 39, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. This guy has some wisdom. This guy has some understanding. He's not believing in Jesus, but he is using his mind. He's thinking things through. If God's really behind these 11 guys that are standing before us, we're fighting against God to try and pick this fight. So that's his reasoning. And it makes them happy. They, they say, you know what? That makes sense. Look at the next verse, verse 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them. I mean, think about that. He says, we got to give them some space. This isn't going to look good. This isn't good optics. We're going to lose some power. We're going to lose some influence if we don't do this thing carefully. And they go, that sounds good. They call them all in and beat them up. I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but that's what they did. But here we've got these apostles. They said, don't talk about Jesus. Don't go around Jerusalem. You're going to try and blame us for this. And Peter says, this is all your fault. He says, let's talk about Jesus. And they get beaten for it. They beat them up. And then they send them out. Look at the next two verses. And they departed from the presence of the council. What's that next word say? Rejoicing. Think about that. Rejoicing. That is so far, that is so far from my experience in this life. It's so far from it. I wish that I could look at my life and say, I have suffered for Jesus and I was glad to. Because I don't. I've been so pampered in my life. There's been times where we've had less money than some. There's been times when we barely have enough money to keep moving forward. That's both as a child, as an adult, in college. There's been times when things have been tight. But I've always eaten food. I've always had a roof. 
I've always had clothing. That's not a struggle. That's not something that I can compare to the apostles being beaten by, count, by the council. I look and I wish that I could say, if God put me through dark, dark days, I'd rejoice through it. Because I've not seen them like they have seen them. But we look and we see what God's perspective here is then. Look at that verse there. He says, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They were told straightly, remember? They were told very plainly. The instruction was clear. They were threatened with death. And when they were uh, uh, counseled through that, they said, you know what, let's give them a little bit of space. And then they were beaten, and they leave after being beaten, rejoicing. And God here, he says, that counts for something. The opportunity to suffer for something. We look and we see, we talked last week about these men uh, who gave us the uh, Constitution, gave us a Declaration of Independence, those who were who were willing to go and fight, those who were willing to lay their necks on the block and lay everything on the line. We're going to succeed or we are going to be killed. They were willing to do that. They were willing to suffer for something that mattered. And I believe that when those men died, if they were Christian people, they'd stand before God. And I believe God would say a willingness to suffer, that counts for something. And in my life, I look and I consider now what I saw in that judgment seat of Master Scott. He is the only one with an opinion that mattered. And TJ went in and TJ did all these things. TJ did everything right. But if those three boards don't break, there's no black belt. And I watched that board roll across and everybody's heart kind of sinks. And when it had broken in half, I remember the very distinct feeling of every eye looking towards Master Scott because he's the only one that had an opinion. And he says, that counts. That counts for something. And every single one of us, we will one day stand before God, the master, the master of it all. And I hope to God that my life isn't spent so much on the things that God's going to say doesn't count. It doesn't matter. The stuff I have, everybody's opinion of what is right versus what the word of God says doesn't count. But do I have a faith in my life? Am I willing to pick up the word of God and say, if, the God, if God tells me something, I'm going to believe it. Just as God looked up at the, as Abraham looked up at the stars and said, you know what? I believe that. God says that counts for something. Do you pick this book up and say, I believe it? Has there been a time in your life where you've gone to God and said, God, I'm a, I'm a sinful person. I need salvation. I need to ask you to forgive me and place your faith in Christ. That counts for something. Do you wake up in the morning and say, this whole world has an idea of what's important to me. But God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. And I am going to do that thing. I'm going to stand up for what is right. I'll put faith and trust in the God that is leading me. Those things count. I want my life to count for something. And now I'm looking and I see in the world that I live in, there may be down this road. I'm looking and I, I look at my past. It's been good. It's been safety, it's been comfort, it's been freedom, it's been virtually no opposition, unless you have a thin skin. Virtually no opposition to doing what is right. There may come a day when that opposition strengthens. There may come a day when the hatred towards the church grows to the point where there is actually persecution in our country. Not a thumbs down on a Facebook post. Real. And I look to that future... And there is an opportunity to live a life that counts. Because when God looks at a willingness to suffer for him, that counts for something. We ought to be now, in the state that we live in now, preparing our hearts for opportunities that may come. I have not had opportunity to suffer, but I may be given opportunity to suffer. And I believe the church is going to be successful as a work as a ministry, as a, a, a instrument of God, if we are willing to stand for right in spite of opposition and suffer through things and do what is God's will for us, we'll see great things. 
But if as a church, as soon as things get hard, if there's not a willingness to suffer, we struggle, we die, we scatter. Because we see that in the Word of God also. But then I'll stand before God, and I, if I don't pursue what is good, it's because I'm pursuing something different. And anything other than a willingness to suffer for the cause of Christ, God says it doesn't count. It's a nothing thing. So my challenge to you, think about your life, think about where your heart is. Think about your willingness to follow God. What are the limitations to it? What, what would you say today? I would go to church except for this. I would read my Bible and proclaim Christ unless this was there. Where are those, where are those boundaries? I hope that I never see that in my life. Not so much for myself. Because I hope my kids, hope my kids get to enjoy freedom like I've enjoyed it. But who knows? Is there any preparation for a, a strengthening of the body rather than a crumbling of the body? We ought to consider those things. And the body of Christ will be strong when the individual believers take inventory of their heart and make sure that we are individually solid. Individually making a commitment to, if the Word of God says it, that's what I believe, regardless of what else is said. If God has a desire for me, that's what I want, regardless of what else is desired for me. And we don't have to wait for things to be hard to make those choices. Elevate the Word of God in your heart. Decrease everything else. As, as John says, I must decrease, he must increase. That should be the prayer for all of us. I'm going to pray this morning just for our ministry. And as I pray, I'll be closing. I just encourage you to pray along with me that God will strengthen our resolve on things, give us a boldness that I know that I lack, but I wish that I didn't. Well, let's pray for those things. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to gather together. I thank you for uh, the instruction that you give. There's so many things in the Word of God that we are instructed to do things in the Word of God we are instructed not to do. Lord, as we look at our society and the, uh, the TV shows, the things we hear, the news, there's so much that I believe is designed to turn our heart. And Lord, with all of the stuff that is opposed to you, Lord, we as a people, we've got to lift up the Word of God. We have got to hide your Word in our heart. If we consider the idea of a, a flesh versus a spirit, our flesh is so being filled with this world. Is our spirit also being fed? Lord, we need to ask ourselves those questions. And as a church, I believe it is our job, it's our responsibility to lead by example within our community, to be the people that lift ye up, to be the people who do right when others do wrong. And Lord, I pray for our families. I pray for us as individuals. I pray that we can love you as we ought to. I pray that we can love you when good days are good pray that we can love you when days are hard. And I believe that separates us from so many, or at least it should. So Lord, we love you. Pray to bless the rest of our day. Keep us safe. Bring us back here safely also. Thank you for the blessings you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed this morning.